This meeting is being recorded. Some is going to tell us about these kinds of integers and what kept Cox at that night. Thank you for coming to us and taking care of Thank you very much for uh, the introduction, Parker, and thank you very much also for the invitation to give a talk here. It's very nice to see you, and I'm excited to be a part of the seminar, which I subscribed to on YouTube a while ago. It's really fun, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about freeze patterns of integers of uh, these are very nice objects, very easy to define things. Um, and they appear in very different places. They come together, they, they, you, can, you can see them in different places. Unfortunately, I have not, I did not meet with them until I was too old. Uh, just only a couple of years ago, I first saw them. And I thought it would be a good idea to introduce these to or younger people in a young in a, in a younger age, so I'm going to do that today. I'm going to also um, I, I used also this seminar as an excuse to learn more about this stuff because I started a new postdoc uh, in September in October, um, and my research is actually going to involve uh, these things. So I thought it could be a nice way to learn more about these. Um, I'm going to just tell you some basic things about freeze patterns. Uh, there is a lot of research going into these things, uh, but I'm going to be very simple and I'm going to tell you some things from representation theory, from, from maybe algebraic geometry or linear algebra, but it's going to be a very um, surface level thing. I'm, going, I'm not going to tell you why things work. I'm not going to tell you um, the, the deep mathematics that's going on. Okay, so let me start. Uh, how do you start a math talk? You give a definition and then you give an example, but today I'm going to make it so that I'm going to give an example and then you will give the definition, hopefully. Um, so my purpose is that you look at these this object that is here for a while and and i'm going to ask you some questions and hopefully we'll figure out what the definition should be so what do you see here we can start with anything Could be very simple. We can go from simple answers to more complete, complete answers. Anybody? Oh, okay. It sounds like we were muted, sorry. Uh, we, had, we figured it out, but I think we all figured it out. Nobody figured it out. You figured it out? Okay, so. No, it's like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Yeah, that's a one time. Yes. And like the ones after some sort of battery, and I don't know if there's really some effort. Okay, we'll start from very beginning. We see some yeah, numbers. So we have some rows of numbers. 
these three dots here tell me that there are infinite remaining numbers here. And um, okay. the first zero, I want to say, row is all of zeros. The first row is all ones. This is row zero, this is row one. And then you can see the last row, it's called n. And this is all ones again. Now, I want to hear what you wanted to say. The audio is not too good, so I'm going to ask what, 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 but let's do it. <laughs> so observations, folks, things we observed. Um, there's like two triangles made with like the, the four, three, three, two, two, two. And then like there's one on the left and there's flipped over on the right side. So like they're like the same. Yes, there is some same things that's going on. That is correct. Inside the triangles on the same row, every number will either be even or odd. So on one row, it's four, two, two, two. On one row, it's three, three, three. On one row, it's two, 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 four. And, on, and then we don't see any more triangles. Okay, that's a good observation too. That is a good observation too. There is some sort of symmetry here. There is like a symmetry. Or there's a glide reflection going on if you can observe it. Um, but what I want to do is to focus on little diamonds. Mm -hmm. If I show you these diamonds here, can you see something that is common in all of them? They all have five. Two days one. Oh, two days one. Uh, sorry, these are the I, I I chose the same things here. Um, let's say, let's choose this one. Mm -hmm. What is common in all of these little diamonds? When you go down a row, it, it increases the um, sum of the elements of the diamond by two, but around some axis of symmetry. One. Okay, that's a good observation. Some, something funky about determinants, maybe? Is there a determinant thing going on? Yes. Matrix like this. Mm -hmm. Oh, they, they, they look like diamonds, but if you turn them a little bit, they, they, are, they are now matrices. Right. And they, they right. seem to have, the, the, all of them seem to have the same determinant negative one? Uh, yes. Oh. Well, we don't like negative numbers, right? So I'm going to Interesting. say that this is an SL2 rule. And I'm going to say that whenever you see a diamond that looks like this, you need to have BC minus AD is equal to one. So a freeze pattern of integers is some rows shifted so we can have these diamonds and the you start with zeros and then you go with ones and then you end with ones and zeros and then the idea is that um, every diamond should satisfy this determinant rule sl2 okay so let's see another example Uh, I should say that for today, this can be gen defined more generally, but for today, we want all um, entries to be positive integers. Okay. So I'll give you another example. Maybe we'll start with zeros and ones again. 
and I'm going to say uh, this should have four rows, so zero, one, two, I'll start counting from um, zero. So you should end with ones. Oh, let's have five rows. Zero, 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 zero. One, 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 one. So we have two rows that we could fill here. I'm going to give you the starting numbers and I will ask you to figure out the rest. So if I give you two and three here, can you tell me what this entry should be? Uh, five, right? Five. Yes, so six minus five is one, so this is five. Now you know, oh, I shifted things wrong. Oh, one, 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 zero, 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 zero. Okay, um, so I have five here. Can you tell me what this entry should be? Which one? This one. Uh, five times something minus three is... Five, uh, 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 D and E. Five times A. Has to be an integer. Yeah, minus. has to be an integer. And we get. It's just positive integer. All oh, right. Okay. Uh, it's D and E. It, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. D and E. Oh, okay. So D does not exist. So this is not an example. This tells us that we cannot start with any two numbers that we like. We have restrictions. So these, this SL2 rule tells us that, okay, there are some conditions that are here and you mm -hmm. cannot That's just say, I will start with two numbers I want and we'll go from there. Okay, so. This means that there is some math to do. Uh, let's start. Understanding uh, freezes of small order. When I say order, what I mean is the number of of rows starting from zero, if you start counting from zero. So there were six rows here, but I start from uh, zero. So this example or non-example would be of order uh, five. So the smallest we can have is order uh, four. That means that we have zeros, ones, zero, uh, and unknown row. And then we close again with ones and zeros. Can you, start counting zero? can you see, uh, can, can, can you find what are the possible numbers that we can put in here? In the zero. previous example, we saw that we cannot start with two and three. Uh, zero. zero. Um, I want today all just... my entries to be positive integers. Oh, so uh, that won't work. Need two. We, uh, we can put it two here. Two. That works. You also do one. Uh, so if I put two here, what is this one? Um, that's a one. That's one, exactly. So if I start with two, the next one has to be one. The previous one also has to be one. And if I have one here, this will be a two. And this will repeat itself. One, two, one, two, one, two. And if you start with one, then you are going to have 
to the next one. Can you have a bigger number? Is the number of rows not five? Yeah. Oh, we, he's no. doing, oh, we start counting at zero. Oh, right. For some reason it's so zero. If the row is just zeros, then it's the uh, row number zero. We're counting like comp side. Like comp side. So if I have, let's say, two numbers here, A and B, I know that AB minus one should be equal to one. AB is equal to two. And two is a prime number, which means that either A is equal to two and B is equal to one, or A is equal to one and B is equal to two. So we really have only one option for uh, freezes of order four. Now let's analyze order five. We have zeros, ones to start with. Let's put A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, uh, ones, and some zeros. We are interested in finding what possible ABCs we can put in here. So we have these SL2 identities. Let's start with this one. This tells me that I have AB minus F is equal to one. Um, we can do this one. It tells me that BC minus G is equal to one. And I have this green one, which is uh, FG minus B is equal to one. And what I did when I was trying to figure out, let's just play with these identities. So it gets messy, but I wrote them down here. So I can multiply which one? Let's multiply the last one. by A. But if you do that, you'll get AFG minus AB is equal to A. And this tells you that AFG is equal to A plus AB. And then using the first blue equation here, you can say that this is equal to A plus F plus one. So understand the equation AFG is equal to A plus F plus one, okay. where AFG are positive integers. What can we do? So You are multiplying A and F here, and then you're adding A and F here, and then you're adding one. So we should expect that there are not too many solutions here. Right. And we should expect that whatever solutions exist, they should be small numbers, because if we multiply a number, let's say, if we take A to be 20, we have 20 times FG, and it's less likely to be equal to 20 plus F plus one, right? So multiplying is usually just making things bigger. So we expect 
solutions if exist should not be big. So let's see some small numbers. If let A is equal to one, what happens? A is equal to one implies FG is equal to F plus two. This tells me that F times G minus one is equal to two. And what is two? It's a prime. prime. Thank you. It's an so even prime. F is equal to two and G is equal to two, or um, G equals one. F G. is equal to one and G is equal to three. Equal to oh, oh. Yeah, G, G minus one is equal to one. You are right, and then that was that means. All right. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're done. G is equal to two. So if A is one. Either f is equal to two and g is equal to two, and or um, f is equal to one and g is equal to three. And if you notice, if I know what a f r, I can already figure out the rest of this phrase because uh, if I know what a and f is, that will tell me what b is. Then I can know what g is, and I can know what c is, and then h is. I can figure out the rest of it if I know what A and F are in this example. Okay. So the case A is equal to two. Remember our equation is AFG is equal to A plus F plus one. So this will give me two FG is equal to F plus three. And this means I have uh, F times 2g minus 1 is equal to 3. And again, 3 is a prime number. So either f is equal to 3 and g is equal to 2, I think. Or f is equal to 1 and g is equal to. Isn't, wait, equal, isn't it? Wait, this time g equals 1, right? Yeah, this is 2 and this is 1. Thank you. I was trying to see if people catch. <laughs> so these are two uh, possibilities. If we do take A is equal to three, let's do this too. Three FG is equal to F plus four. And this will tell me F times three G minus one is equal to four. Now four is at a prime. So we can have uh, F is equal to one f is equal to 2 and f is equal to 4. Well, it turns out that we can't have all of these because if f is equal to 1, 3g minus 1 is equal to 4, then 3g is equal to 5, so g is equal to 5 over 3. That doesn't work. If f is equal to 4, then 3g minus 1 is equal to 1, so g is equal to 2 over 3. That doesn't work. So we have only one option. F is equal to two and G is equal to something. Three G is equal to two, G is equal to one. And it's already half past. So I'm going to say no solutions. Or a bigger than or equal to four because the left hand side becomes too big. Actually, let's let's try to figure out. Okay, so let me just say we have a f g is equal to a plus f plus one. This gives me that uh, a f g ah. Let's say it this way. Uh, when a is bigger than or equal to four, 
already a times f is bigger than a plus f plus one. Mm. Indeed, um, af is less than or equal to a plus f plus one. This will imply, or this is equivalent to saying that uh, af minus a is less than or equal to f plus one. And this would mean that a times f minus one is less than or equal to f plus one. And this would mean that a is less than or equal to f plus one and f minus one. And as we have been discussing, as I, I mentioned earlier, if you take f to be a very large number, you'll see that this will converge to one. So that shouldn't be any examples. Uh, but also f plus one over f minus one is always less than or equal to three. So for, for this orange identity or inequality to work, we should have uh, a is less than or equal to three, but we are assuming a is, less, a is bigger than or equal to four. So we'll always have this inequality here, which would mean that we do not have any solutions to a f g is equal to a plus f plus four. Whatever g is, left-hand side is always bigger. Anyways, so we have these numbers that we said a is one, f is two, and g is two, a is one, f is one, and g is three. Yes, and um, a is two, f is three, g is one. A is two, F is one, and G is two. And A is three, F is two, and G is one. Okay, so I'm going to copy this. How do I copy this? You know what? I am not going to copy it. I'm going to write it here again. Sorry. Zero, 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 zero. One, 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 one. And then I put uh, A, B, C, D, E. And this was F, G, H, I, J here. So let's start with Let's put uh, one, 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 and zero, 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 zero. Okay, so let's write down what we have. We have, let's start with the first one. This is one, uh, this is F is two. And once you have this, you can get the rest of it. This is one, so this is, has to be three. And uh, this has to be a two. And this has to be a one. Um, oh. This has to be a one. And this has to be a two. And this has to be a three. And uh, this has to be two. Okay, so we figured these ones out and this has to be a one. But if you look at this now, you'll see we already have the second example here. One, one, and three is already here. 
since this is an infinite row situation and they repeat, we already have the second answer here. Now we look at two, three, one, and you see, let's put that green. You'll see that it's appearing here. We already have that. And two, one, two, it looks like it's not here, but it actually is. It's just hiding somewhere here. But that's two, that's one. So that is supposed to be, just two, one, two. Could you extend it to the left or the right? And might, it might show up. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that is a one. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, it is here. Thank okay. you. So this is the gray one here, and it's here, the fourth one. And we have a three, two, one, which is this one. Cool. So okay. again, there is only one freeze of order. Uh -huh. Oh, whoa. Okay, uh, we're burning uh, in the witchcraft now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was a witch. A witch. Thank you. <laughs> he, was the, he was the same as a duck. All right. Um, so you can try to make a conjecture for each order. There is a unique. There is a unique. Um, Next number is saying that all the ones we thought were on there. Right? Yeah, all possible solutions already show up. So conjecture. There is a unique freeze pattern uh, for each order. And turns out. This is too optimistic. That's wrong. But we have, when we go one more, analyze order six. We can see two different ones. You already met one of them here in the first example. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yeah, this is order 6. The first row, the first non-constant non, non row of this was um, 2, 1, 4, 1, 2, 2. And then it repeats itself. So we have Two, one, four, two, 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 as the first non constant row. And once you have that non constant row, you can figure out what the next row is, what the next row is. Once you know this first row, first non zero row, you can figure out the rest. But we also have. One, two, three, one, two, three. So there are actually two of them when you go order six. And you can analyze order seven. And so we had one in order four. One uh, number of things, uh, number of freezes. Order four, there is one. Order five, there is one. Order six, there is two. What do you think order seven will be? We're sneakily saying three over here. Okay, three is correct. I'm seeing three. <laughs> the next one's five. <laughs> oh no! I'm, I'm suspecting the Fibonacci. Sick. All right. One is two. So, one is three. Two is five. I'm going to stop. 
if it right. freezes here and I'm going to tell you some linear algebra. Right, right. Um, or maybe this yeah. linear algebra strikes again. Mm. Well, yeah, another muffin for them. <laughs> Really so consider a two by n matrix of rank two. Oh no! Where? So you have a one one, a one two. I've been teaching the algebra for so long. This feels so natural to me writing these a. Oh no! Uh, it's not square. <laughs> okay, so we have this uh, matrix. That becomes zero. There is a thing called minors of a matrix, as I think you know, and you do determinants, you learn about these things. Which so matrix? consider non square matrix. Um, two by that. two minors. Remove a row and column of oh, this matrix. Minus. So what does this mean? I give you two of the minor. Given I and J, different numbers. Consider the two by two matrix. Oh. Uh, that you get that has the I and jth columns of the original matrix. Mm -hmm. Then take its determinant. Oh, my oh. oh. The minor and number. Call it two columns. Yeah. And it's P I J. So for example, if you have one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. No. Then P one two will be the determinant of one two five six, mm -hmm. and this is equal to six minus ten. Okay, so that's what a minor is for me. Um. For me, P is for if you have heard of this name, just an extra information. Um, these okay, these things. I, just, I said algebraic geometry a little bit at the beginning. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say it in words. Um, when you have a rank two, met, two by n matrix, that means that you have two rows which are linearly independent. So basically, it means that you have a plane in the n-dimensional space, a two-dimensional sub, the row space of this matrix. It's a two-dimensional subspace of an n-dimensional space. You can, con you can consider the collection of all such things, and that has a name. It's called the Grassmannian of two-dimensional subspaces inside n-dimensional space. So these Plucker, these Plucker things gives an embedding of this Grassmannian. It's an algebraic thing. It's an algebraic variety. It gives an embedding of uh, the grass manual of planes into projective space. And they satisfy certain uh, relations. So whenever you have I is less than J, less than K, and less than L, um, let's put one and N here. We have PIK times PJL is equal to PIJ times PKL plus PIL times PJK. 
and these are called fluke relations. So what you can do is you can consider an algebra, finite generated algebra, that is generated by all the fluke coordinates, all the all, all these um, PIJs. And then you can quotient out by this relations. You can, you can consider this thing a module of these relations. And that is going to be the coordinate ring of uh, this embedding of the Grassmannian inside the projective space. Okay. Around 2003, I guess, somebody whose last name is Scott showed that this algebra has the structure of a cluster algebra. You don't need to know what it is. Um, but basically, there are clusters. And um, you can, you, you, OK, here's the idea. Using these relations that you see here, um, you can create, you can, you can find all the plucker, all the PIJs, all the plucker coordinates using only some of them. I'm going to tell you how this works. So we have, you can consider, I'm saying witchcraft again, sorry. We can consider an N-gon. Then each PIJ, uh, N-gon whose vertices R uh, one to n, and each pij corresponds to a diagonal in this angle. Right. So for the case, let's say n is equal to six. So n is equal to five, you'll have a pentagon and then you have these diagonals here. Um, this and I guess this is not it. So let's say this is one, two, three, four, five. This diagonal here connecting one and five will correspond to P15. This diagonal that connects one and three will be P13 and so on. So here's a fact then. If you consider a forgot the word, triangulation of the n-gon. That means you look at a maximal uh, set of diagonals that do not intersect, that do not cross, they, they do not cross each other. Then, you can create uh, all blue curve coordinates. So what do I mean by this? As you can see, there are too many diagonals here. They keep intersecting. So I'm going to erase some of them. Uh, I paused my screen sharing for some reason. Okay, it's back. Um, so now I have a triangulation. And this fact is telling me that if I know all the diagonals that appear in here, I can create using, I can figure out 
all the other ones that do not appear here by using Pluker relations. You can try this by uh, taking a two by five matrix and starting only from the determinants, the minors that correspond to these diagonals, you can see using Pluker relations, you can create the other ones. Okay, I need to be done before five, two, right? I do, yes, that would be very much appreciated. Okay, then I'm going to say a theorem. <laughs> This is a theorem of Conway and Coxeter. So this is what kept them up at night. Yeah. Yes. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Whoa. Wait for it. Between <laughs> triangulations. Mm of an n-gon and freezes of order n. Witchcraft. Yes. So let's look at the case n equals four. We have this, I mean, I'm going to say triangulations up to something probably and freezes of order and up to something. But if you look at this, there is only one way to triangle, triangleize, I triangle, triang, triangleize, I don't know. Triangulations. I don't know what the verb form of this thing is, but there's only one way you can do this. Triangulate. Triangulate, yes, thank you, triangulate the foregone square. And if you consider n is equal to five, again, as we have seen before, there is only one way to do this, this. You can try to change it, but it's going to be the same. So you can, for instance, do this and this, but these are same, isomorphic, whatever. Okay, and I'm going to tell you how a triangulation will give you a freeze. Basically, you go and look at each vertex. At this vertex, there's only one triangle. Mm. Right. At this vertex, there are two triangles. At this vertex, there is one triangle. At this <laughs> oh. triangle. So you have a freeze that goes like this. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, uh, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. And that's it. This is order 4. Now you go to n equals 5. This is the video. That's it. Draw a nicer pentagon. And let's draw a triangulation. Here you have one, here you have two triangles, here you have two triangles, here you have one triangle, and here you have three triangles. So you have a sequence one, two, two, one, three. If you go back and look at the ones we wrote here. Uh, that's one, two, two, one, three. One, two, two, one, two. Something like that. Maybe. Maybe. Yes. One, two, two, one, three. Yeah. So, and not only you can get the first row of the freezes I did like this. You can also get um, 
all the other numbers actually that are appearing in these freezes by considering certain perfect matchings uh, in these triangulations, but um, I'm not going to go into that. This is a nice theorem and this is cool. The representation theory part that is going on here is if anybody is interested in it, idea of cluster algebras and cluster categories and cluster combinatorics, people like to say. So there, I, mean, I didn't have to tell you about grass menus. I didn't have to tell you about linear algebra at all. I could just start with uh, these triangulations and tell you there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Now I just wanted to say those things because in the abstract, I said representation theory. All right, thank you very much. Awesome, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and you're perfectly on time, that's amazing. Uh, I'm going to send you the tradition of getting out this feedback form. Uh, for people who are online, please fill that out, that would be much appreciated. For people in the rooms, and we can discern if you could fill this out. This is what gets us muffins and coffee, it's very thin. Um, so we'll fill that out, and then we'll take questions from Osgur in three minutes. So Osgur will have a glass of water, but we'll take questions in a moment, okay? We right now, I just saw some. Okay, I did not really understand what Parker said. Anybody can translate it to me. Hello, am I audible? Hello. Yeah, I had one question. Yes. Yeah, so like so could you like suggest some like further or like reading material for today's lecture? Because like it was very exciting for me, like to to to, to know about this very wonderful new topic. Yeah. So could you uh, like oh. suggest me some references of reading material about this? Uh so if you look at this paper by Karin Bauer on freeze patterns of integers. Uh, it is like a survey on this topic. And um, it is on archive, freely available. Uh, and there are so many references. I, I, I don't think I can write down all of them because there's there's so much work, but if you look at that paper and if you read all the re if you look at all the references in that paper, there's going to be a lot of things. Thank you so much, and uh, and uh, thank you so much for the wonderful lecture. You're welcome. Thank you. So uh, a great question in the room yeah, but proving that, right? is how do you count the triangulations? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> uh, no. How many triangulations are there? Right? How do you count the triangulations? Uh, that's a good question. I do not know. I actually do not know if it's a Fibonacci sequence or not. Um, I tried to Google. I, I tried to look at this OISE. Um, database of sequences. I just don't know how, how, how to Google it. I, I tried to say number of triangulations, but people do count usually apparently different ones differently. So, so I'm not so sure what I'm looking at. Some people say Catalan numbers, but I think that's not what I'm looking at. We leave it as an exercise. Yes, I I I I actually don't know the answer, so I didn't say I think too much.
Any other comments or questions? Parker, you are muted. This thing. Yeah, this thing's symmetric, but only yeah, so it's like... not reflection, but rotational symmetric. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh what if these only reflections? You can't like oh this one like but that's dependent. Any other questions from online? Any other online questions? So trippy. Uh, okay, I think that's it. Oh, yeah. um, I think that's our last couple of Thank you. Thank you. Next thank week, you. CS talk. So next week, CS talk. Last me. Last me. Do we join Parker now? I bet. Awesome. Thank you. Bye bye.